Hey there, gang. Last week I began a series related to our 2012 season which looks at each of our productions and puts them in a historical and cultural context. Today my subject is Moby Dick, and of course, when we hear that title, the first thing that comes to our minds is whales. Today we think of these mammals as among the most magnificent creatures on Earth, fascinating animals that seem to have great intelligence, overpowering strength, and even personalities. We gaze and wonder at them as we observe them on film or from a boat, as mother whales protect and guide their children, as the males guard over their pods or families, and when we hear those mysterious sounds that scientists have recorded of, of whales communicating with each other. It's hard to believe that just over a century ago, whales were one of the most hunted and sought-after animals in the world for a very important byproduct. Oil. Whale oil was a valuable commodity in the age before fossil fuel, petroleum, and gasoline. Along with coal, it was an important source of energy, especially for using in lamps to light your house, to make candles, and as lubrication for all sorts of everyday uses. It was even important in the manufacture of paint. Different types of whales gave different kinds of products, but the rarest and most expensive product was spermaceti. Spermaceti is a highly refined, rich, waxy substance found in the head cavity of the giant sperm whale. It's oily to the touch and it has no smell and no taste. It was therefore useful in the making of perfumes, cosmetics, leatherwork, and textiles of various kinds. Spermaceti is still used in various countries' space programs like the Mars Rover Project and the Hubble Telescope because it's a lubricant that will work very well in extreme temperatures. The thing is, you can't get spermaceti without a dead whale. Because of the importance of these biological byproducts of whales, a whole industry sprung up that reached its height in the 19th century, whaling. Whaling began in earnest in the 17th century and was generally active up until the 1930s. Today, it's a highly regulated industry thanks to the International Whaling Commission, which sets limits on how many whales each country can legally hunt. There is no whaling in the United States except for a few Alaskan tribes who've hunted whales for endless generations and who depend on whale meat and other byproducts for their livelihood. But in the 19th century, whaling was huge in this country, and it very nearly destroyed the whale as a species, much the same way as the American bison or buffalo nearly became extinct on land because of hunting. It was this whaling industry, the lore of the whaling ship which often spent two years on a single voyage, and the men who lived and worked on those ships that inspired one of the greatest American novels, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Moby Dick is about an obsessed captain of a whaling ship, Captain Ahab, who had a frightening and life-changing encounter with a giant white sperm whale on a previous whaling voyage and lost his leg in the process. In the book, he takes advantage of another whaling voyage to hunt and kill this albino whale known as Moby Dick to take revenge on it for the loss of his leg. But that's just the basic story, the outline of the book. The book is huge, and actually it's far more about than just Captain Ahab and his search for revenge. There are many characters in the book, most especially the young sailor Ishmael, who narrates the story and has come along on the voyage looking for adventure. There is also Queequeg, the Pacific Islander who becomes Ishmael's closest friend and helps him understand and appreciate differences in people with regards to customs, friendship, and religion. There is Starbuck, the first mate, who is morally torn between loyalty to his captain and loyalty to the owners of the ship who expect the ship, named the Pequod, to come back to shore with tons of whale oil. But all of this is nothing to Captain Ahab, who wants only one thing, to hunt and kill Moby Dick and exact his ultimate revenge. There have been movies and plays, even a musical, made based on the story of Moby Dick, and finally now an opera. The opera's by the American composer Jake Heggie and his librettist Gene Shear. 
What they've done, I think, is extremely brave because they've taken an 800-page book and edited it down to the core story, turned it into musical and textual poetry so that it can live on stage. It's a perfect marriage of words and music as the opera describes how it must feel as well as what it sounds like to be on a 19th century whaling vessel in the open sea. Just think, if you were a composer, how would you portray that? What kinds of musical instruments would you use to describe the ocean, the water, Ahab's obsession with Moby Dick, or the sound of the whale? What kind of language would you use to portray these fascinating characters? And it's a, in, in a way, it's like writing a movie, but in, the, in this case of opera, the movie is alive and on stage. It's performed in real time in front of you, the audience, so that you can understand, participate, and feel what it must have been like to be on a boat in the middle of the ocean and know that your captain, your leader, the one you depend on to get you back safely to shore is insane because of his determination to kill this whale above everything else in his life. It's an amazing journey, and one that I know you'll enjoy taking with me. I'm Nick Ravellis. I'll see you at the opera.